Hmm. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our seminar today. We are delighted to be bringing this hybrid event to you. We're both here in, at UCL and also online via Zoom. So welcome if you're joining us here in the room and also for all of you joining us all around the world. So what I'd like to do is uh, start off with uh, a little bit of a presentation to just introduce to you the, um, the UCL Morning Research Centre and also some of the key concepts of what we're going to be talking about today. And then uh, Professor Brian Golding will be giving us an overview of the book and then we'll be having a panel and some discussions and then there's an opportunity for you to ask questions. So if you're in the room, please feel free to put your hand up and ask questions. We have roaming mics so that everyone can, can hear online. And for those on the, online, please do feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, ask questions in the chat, and we will pick those up and, and put those to the panel if we have time too. So hopefully we'll have lots of good questions. So I just wanted to very, very briefly give an overview of the Warning Research Centre for those of you who are new to us. Uh, we are the first dedicated warning research centre that looks at natural and human-made hazards. And what we are trying to do is bring different experts and stakeholders together from a range of different disciplines, geographies, and different social and livelihood contexts. And what we're wanting to do is learn from different hazards, from different organisations, and, and bring that academic critical eye in as well, so that we can both put research into practice, but also practice into research. And so in many ways, we hope that this process will help us rethink how we can make warnings more efficient and more effective going forward. So as a key objective, we're hoping to become that centre of excellence that brings the warning community together and to help share ideas and solve the many complex problems that we face within the warning world. We also want to be a bit of a broker in terms of providing uh, warning expertise for those that, that are looking for it, as well as policy advice, public engagement, and also help put warnings on the agenda. Now that's been significantly helped by the UN Secretary General, which I'll come back to uh, shortly, but we were launched just over a year ago by Manny Mizutori. So we're really excited um, to be here today um, hosting this book launch uh, specifically on warnings and relating to weather, but many lessons of which are valuable to other hazards. So we've got a number of different collaborators. We've got over 30 core members here at UCL looking at warnings and 30 affiliates from all around the world. And we are partnered with the Anticipation Hub and also with the Risk Informed Early Action Partnership. We have a number of different activities that you can see on the side, but we run a number of different events such as webinars, conferences, workshops. We've got a website that we're going to be expanding with more data and information in the future. We do a number of engagement activities, sharing news relating to warnings and, and public engagement events. We do consultation projects and, of course, we do research, which is the fundamental <coughs> component of academic work. So we've got PhD students, uh, postdocs, we look for research grants relating to, to warnings, and we are developing some warnings modules as well. And we have been providing some CPD courses as well to a number of different organisations. So this is some of our recent activity of what we've been up to. So please do um, follow our social media online to have a look at what we're up to and what webinars we have. We've had webinars focused on infectious disease warning systems, wildfires. We've looked at films, warnings in films, and we've also looked at warnings specifically in Malaysia as well. So we're really um, trying to bring a breadth and diversity of different perspectives of looking at warnings. So this is where you can find out a little bit more about us. So please do join our social media. All our webinars and events are recorded and placed online, so you can watch them on YouTube um, when it's either the right time of day for you or if you wanted to see something further. So today, of course, our session today is looking at towards the perfect weather warning. And of course, uh, for those of you who are in the UK, um, I know that many of the people in the room here today are thoroughly uh, delighted with the fact that we have air conditioning <laughs> after the heat of the last few uh, days or, or weeks, obviously. Um, but yes, yeah, so we're really looking at how uh, warning, and we can see how warnings uh, for weathers have um, helped prepare uh, people to, uh, for this, this heat wave, but perhaps not prepared them for some of the knock-on consequences, some of the fires that we've seen, some of the other uh, impacts as well. And of course, people always don't quite think that events are going to be as bad as they're made out. And of course, uh, the Met Office were pretty spot on uh, with their temperature, which was incredible. So as I mentioned before, early warnings have become a UN agenda, um, as the Secretary General has highlighted that many, many people around the world are not uh, having access to early warnings. We know that warning systems help mitigate the cost of the impact of, of, of hazards and various other threats, 
um, many of us are being increasingly exposed to multiple hazards, not just single hazard events, but many, many, many different hazards that are either occurring concurrently or um, on knock-on uh, cascading events as such. And so what we need to do is make sure that we're looking towards not just providing warnings, but making sure that those warnings are impact based as well, that people understand them, they receive that information and, and they believe them as well. And so um, some of the work that's been done by the World Meteorological Organization has looked at this and uh, stated that only one in three people are covered adequately by early warning systems. Um, so, of course, there's lots and lots of work to be done with this initiative over the next five years in terms of making sure that everyone is covered by warnings. Um, but the World Meteorological Office will be heading up this initiative um, with collaboration with lots of interested parties. And of course, the UK Met Office and WMO have been working on this a lot, and that's what this book is going to be presenting today. It gives us an insight as to what are some of the key elements of this book. I really enjoyed looking over this book. Um, I just wanted to highlight two really key things here that I know Brian is going to be um, looking at as well. And um, essentially, uh, what we need to make sure we are doing is making sure that we are working across partnerships. And this is what the book really, really highlights. And this is really good because this really fits in with what the Warning Research Centre is really trying to hammer home is the importance of working across silos. So, so important. And that involves communication, building trust, coordination between all the various organizations um, and as the book puts it communication and partnership are fundamental so we're absolutely in agreement with the, the findings of this book which is absolutely uh, brilliant and the need for trust so the last thing is i know brian will be talking about this but is the warning value cycle and this is a really important uh, concept and idea that really helps us think about the links between different components of warnings now, this isn't meant as a, as a linear system. This is sort of a circular system. And what's really brilliant about this book is also it focuses on the first mile. So putting those that are vulnerable and key decision makers uh, right at the center of the process and putting them in the, the first mile and not the last mile. And so this book with this really great graphic here that talks about the five valleys of death, which I'm sure Brian will explain where that title comes from, which is quite interesting, um, is to, you know, to, create those bridges across these different elements um, and to create that communication and that trust to make sure that information is integrated appropriately and used um, both you know both top down and, and bottom up so we are really delighted that um, brian is here today to to launch the book so we'd like to invite brian to come up and give us an overview of the talk today Move this one side. There we go. Thank you very much. Okay, can you hear me all right? Good, good. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about the book. I'm going to give a uh, a very brief run through of what's in the book and what we see. Uh, I've, I've picked out, I think, what are perhaps the most uh, important points from each of the chapter chapters. So uh, the book itself, um, can I get rid of the, yes, I can. Um, the book, so the book's aim is to make weather warnings more effective. Um, weather warnings have value in saving lives, saving property, infrastructure and livelihoods in the presence of, of a hazard. Um, and we want those warnings to be more effective. Uh, but the underlying theme, as Karina has already said, is, is partnership. Uh, it's aimed at mainly at professionals and trainee professionals uh, it, with a role in weather warnings. So a practical aim, um, but I'm sure it will be of interest to many others, including those doing research in this area. Um, it's been endorsed by WMO and by the UN uh, Office for Disaster Risk Reduction and the head of UNDRR, the United Nations Secretary General's Special Representative, Ms. 
Mami Mitsutori, uh, contributed the foreword to the book. There are actually 49 authors. We didn't quite make the round figure uh, from 13 countries. And obviously, uh, the, it, it is very much a partnership uh, piece of work. Um, we, uh, we work together in the eight chapters. Um, and it makes reference to a vast body of research that has been carried out mainly over the last 10 years or so, uh, but some going back further than that. And I think there are some 500 uh, references in the book. So starting with the introduction. Um, so early warnings are an important contributor to disaster risk management uh, for current hazards. And that's where I come from. And that's perhaps uh, where we're thinking of. But they're also an important contribution to climate adaptation, because as we have seen in recent times, uh, a changing climate means uh, some hazards at least become more extreme. Uh, some new hazards may appear in a country that didn't consider them a problem in the past. And warnings are the first line of defense to enable people to avoid the consequences of those, uh, those hazards. Uh, the other um, uh, management responses such as um, uh, land use planning and, and building and so on, of course, take much longer to, to deal with. Uh, so the warning value cycle links the needs of the decision maker with the sources of forecast information. And in the warning process, information is lost or distorted. And that's what we call the valleys of death. And I'll show the diagram again in a minute. The, the term comes from business. Um, and it is essentially about the lack of communication between silos, wherever those silos occur. So partnerships among those relevant organizations and disciplines are really important because they build the bridges that mean that that information is not lost, that it's effectively communicated, translated and interpreted. So the book then is structured uh, as follows. Uh, chapter two uh, is a little bit different from the others in that it describes the role of warnings within a risk governance framework. And I'm going to emphasize this because it's really difficult to have a first class warning system if you haven't got a risk governance framework in a country that supports it. Uh, we fortunately have in this country, um, uh, introduced in 2004, the um, uh, risk, uh, um, I can't remember what it was called now, but anyway, the, um, uh, the framework for risk governance, which essentially says that everybody is responsible for the risks that they have control over, which is um, really important. And then the rest of the book describes the five bridges. We start at the user end, the decision maker, uh, and we work up the chain, uh, looking at the, the communication that's needed to get the information to the next person down the chain so that it meets those needs that we started with. And then chapter eight wraps up, uh, looks at the whole warning chain as a, uh, as a single entity and offers a template for an effective warning system. So here's the um, uh, five values of death again, uh, with, with a, a small creature added at the end. Um, so mountain, the mountains in the picture represent the bodies of expertise that are involved in producing a good and effective um, an excellent warning. And actually most countries have that expertise in various places. Um, but if you start off with the weather service at the left-hand end of the diagram, produce a weather service and send it to somebody without considering how they're gonna use it, it will fall into the valley of death because it'll be in the wrong language, it won't be understood, it won't be used. So each of these bridges has to be built. It has to be built on trust, on getting to know the needs of each partner so that, and of course the whole thing needs to be built on understanding what the decision is that has to be taken, who's taking it, what their context is, and therefore how, what information they need and how they're gonna receive it. 
So moving on then to chapter two, um, and we have um, a, a group of authors uh, from the, uh, mainly from the uh, humanitarian sector, um, looking at governance. So warnings sit in a wider risk management policy framework set by government for the security of its people. And that is always a government responsibility. Um, that framework defines then the components of the warning system. It defines the roles of the main actors and it defines the, the requirements for performance monitoring. It's actually really difficult for a government department to do proper monitoring if it isn't defined by government as part of its job. Um, so this governance, as I said before, this governance aspect is really important. That said, once you've, just, you've got that framework, um, an effective warning system then depends on the partnerships among those creating, communicating and responding to the warning information. And in this chapter, uh, the authors present an eight component framework for a people-centered early warning system. So centered on the people who will actually be affected at the end of the day. Uh, it emphasizes integration and it emphasizes an all society approach. Many countries focus on getting warning information to the emergency managers. And they do that on the basis that the emergency managers will protect the people. It doesn't work. So often you see people being killed because the emergency managers couldn't do anything when they received the warning and the people who were affected simply didn't know it was coming. And I've looked at cases from last year where sadly many people died because they simply didn't know what was coming. Um, you need to understand the nature and the distribution of risk. And that means understanding not just where and when the hazards will occur, but who is exposed to them, where the uh, exposed uh, elements of society are and their vulnerability, and then the capacity of the communities that are at risk. All of those need to be understood for, for proper management and for design of the warning system. And of course, uh, the impact of multiple hazards is a key issue. Uh, so often, particularly, I think, in um, urban areas, it's not the primary hazard that kills people. It's the secondary hazard or the tertiary hazard in a cascade where uh, infrastructure is affected, where critical services are interrupted. Um, and of course, in order to realize benefits, the warning must be received. That means uh, you've got to get to people. And if you've lost um, uh, communication uh, media, then you've got to use alternative ones. It's got to be understood and it's got to be acted on. Or to put it in the, the, the shorthand version, it's got to be useful, usable and used. And uh, the other key point that we bring out here is that, and going back, it goes back to the governance thing really, uh, success, a successful early warning system requires long-term commitment uh, by government, usually. Commitment to funding, commitment by stakeholders, uh, because partnerships are not built in a day. Um, and those stakeholders include local communities, government departments, and the private sector. The media are really important, um, and re regional uh, players, re regional councils, and so on. And um, I should be saying this many times throughout this, but the, the social components of the process and the technical components are of equal importance. They are both important. Uh, communication, nothing will, will be of any value if there's no communication, but if the information that's communicated is duff, then equally there's no, uh, no value in the system either. So you've got to concentrate on both and to have a balance. Uh, so uh, one of the things we look at in this first chapter is the uh, uh, definition of risk, the breakdown of risk into its components. And um, 
Uh, we spend a little bit of time looking at the inform breakdown. There, there are others, um, but um, sorry, that's um, uh, something that has been used in uh, successfully in assessing humanitarian crises. Um, and these dimensions of risk are something we need to focus on in when we're putting together a system for uh, uh, warning people effectively of not just what the weather will be, but what it'll do and how they need to respond to it. So moving on then to chapter three. Um, so chapter three is the first of our valleys of death, and it's the valley of death between the warning and the decision maker. Um, and we have a uh, quite a large uh, authorship for this chapter, all listed there, along with their institutional logos. So warning communication aims to achieve an awareness of risk by each of the receivers of the warning, which allows them to take cost-effective actions to reduce impacts consistent with the warning producer's capabilities. And that's an important thing, because if the warning is very uncertain, you don't want people taking very costly actions that they may come to regret if, the, uh, if nothing happens. Um, so it needs to be, it, it's quite a subtle challenge, this, particularly for early warnings when you're seeking to get people prepared. Um, and the, the Daily Express is perhaps really good at this process. Um, so uh, a whole range of things affect the way people will respond to a warning. And these are laid out in the chapter with um, links to uh, the research that supports this. So the sources of information, uh, social environmental cues, um, so I, if you see a dark cloud coming up, that's, that will help you to understand, yes, there's a, for, there's a warning of a thunderstorm. I can see a black cloud. This is, this is reinforcing uh, my understanding. The channel access, the, the access to media, the, the preferences people have for where they will get their information from, um, and the person's uh, personal um, uh, characteristics. They all uh, are, are of influence. When we come to thinking about uncertainty, um, as a scientist, I tend to think of quantitative uncertainty in the weather and how that will affect what I need to communicate. But of course, there are many other uncertainties. And uh, in this chapter, we bring out some of those issues, um, uh, legal, social, institutional, political, all sorts of things that will affect how people respond and how we want them to respond indeed. And then what do we know about what produces a good warning message? Well, um, the, the, the summary that we've got here uh, is, is something that we, we talk around in the chapter. So we need to know the hazard. Pe people need to know where the threat is coming from. And, but we also need to know its impact, where and when, and some guidance on uh, what to do about it, what sorts of things uh, you may want to do, and the source of the information, because that will make a difference to how people treat the, the message they're getting. And for each of those aspects, ideally, we want the information to be specific, consistent, accurate, certain, and clear. That's a tall order, uh, but those are the things, those are the directions we should be aiming in. In terms of the channels we reach people with, uh, we, want, we should use as many as we can, but particularly um, aiming to fill gaps. So use the big ones that get to most people, but then look which vulnerable groups are not getting the information. Is there a channel we can use to get to those particular groups? And in some cases, there are very specific channels that will get to a group that's particularly vulnerable. And uh, that's, that's something we should be doing. Um, there's a, an international uh, protocol called the CAP, the Common Alerting Protocol, that enables um, a warning message to be input in a generic form 
and then the protocol itself can be connected to translate that uh, message into a whole range of different uh, media. And that reduces the workload of, of adding these additional routes. Ideally, the warning message should be personalized so that the person receiving it, can, it has a context. So if there is an existing local impact or disruption that is happening as a result, um, perhaps a, a little way upstream, that information is really useful. If you can refer to a local event, again, it makes it personal. People are more likely to respond. Language is, is really important. People can speak many languages in most countries, but they respond to a warning best in their own personal local language. Um, I was in Bali um, two months ago, and they have about 100 or 500 languages or something, but they actually put the warnings out in a lot of languages. Uh, we don't in this country. Um, we're, we're very behind in that respect. It makes a difference, but I'm not sure that Google Translate is enough because you really have to be idiomatic if you're going to use somebody's language for something that's emotive. Um, but um, I, I guess it's better than nothing. And certainly we shouldn't use jargon. We should uh, include decision relevant information and we should be transparent about uncertainty. And that means coming back after the event and explaining why people weren't affected as maybe they expect to be affected. Particularly if somebody nearby was affected, that will be sufficient to, for them to understand that actually it wasn't a failure um, and, and it will build trust. Um, and we mustn't forget, of course, that warnings are constrained by the environment that the person doing the warning sits in, as well as by the person responding. And that's really important. So a forecaster issuing a warning under pressure in the middle of the night after a long day, um, it's a different issue. And um, from, from maybe um, uh, some, somebody in a different situation. And they will have a judgment process. They will have to determine at, at what point do I change this warning, uh, particularly in withdrawing it really difficult to decide to withdraw a warning because there's nothing worse than cancelling a warning and then an hour later finding you shouldn't have done. And the relationship between the warner and the receiver is the key starting point. We need to understand the decision in order to design the warning. Um, and evaluation, uh, evaluation is critical. So here's an example that we include in the chapter uh, from the new warning system, uh, the development of the new warning system in Argentina, um, uh, written by somebody who was closely involved in it. And they started off by contacting the users. In this case, the users, they focused on the emergency managers and they did some um, workshops. Uh, and they gave them a, an, one of the existing text warnings and they got them to draw a map, which um, uh, to put on the map what that warning meant. Um, and you can see three examples there and they're very different. Uh, and in retrospect, you know, those of us who are in the field, <laughs> we understand that's not surprising, um, but it was a big surprise to the weather service. Uh, so they redesigned their their um, warning service in the light of having gone through this process with the uh, emergency managers who they were for. So they produced interoperable messages. They used a traffic light system. Uh, they used maps. They simplified all the nomenclature and they published their thresholds so that people knew what a red warning actually meant. Um, uh, oh, and they also developed for the emergency services, they developed a, a bespoke graphic product, which was designed for sharing on WhatsApp, because that's what the emergency services use. Key point there. 
So we move on to chapter four. Um, chapter four is um, about the gap between the scientists producing the impact information. So epidemiologists, um, uh, 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 engineers, um, um, and, and so on, all sorts of people who can turn a hazard into an impact between them and the communicators who are writing the warning. Very, very different groups of people. And uh, here's the, the list of co-authors. So a very similar message to last time, the success of the warning is that people listen, understand the message and use it to take information, uh, take it act, take action. Impact information is a really important ingredient in helping this to happen. It's not the only ingredient, as we've seen, but it is an important part. A whole range of actors. So, so the first part of the, the chapter, we look at the people who actually produce warnings. And there are actually quite a lot of people who produce warnings. So if you think of um, an energy company, um, they will have people in in house who will warn the rest of the company that they need to take action because there's uh, uh, some hazard coming along, particularly uh, in the case of, of dam operators, for instance, for, for hydro, but, but in, in, in other cases as well. And, and we've seen in recent days the energy people um, having uh, issues with heat and there will be people responsible for those warnings within those organizations and many other infrastructure organizations in the health service and so on and so on. Um, all producing warnings, all drawing information from a variety of sources. Similarly, expertise in weather related hazard impacts is extremely widely distributed. A lot of it in academia. Um, there do not tend to be specific institutes for um, uh, hazard impacts, uh, specific hazard impacts, and there are some. Um, and part of the reason for this is that impact data are often difficult to access, they're often um, very bespoke, uh, they're confidential often, uh, so the data are owned uh, by particular groups and often it's only within those groups that the work can be done. The relationship between the warner and the impact expert um, is a tricky one because the time scales often the uh, impact work is done once and published, um, whereas the person doing the warning is, is offering a service. It, there's, a, there's a mismatch there. So often that uh, relationship can be facilitated through uh, an honest broker sort of organization. And we include a number of examples in the book. Um, and just to uh, pick one of those um, from the Met Office, um, the, um, in, in the uh, social media area, one of the things that the Met Office does is to seek collaborations with uh, partners in, uh, in, in other areas. So in this case, it was the RAC and Highways England that they partnered with, um, and they were going out with some messages about winter weather. And so we partnered with them and added to the information and made it a joint um, activity. And where there's that sort of um, shared uh, aim, it's natural to, uh, uh, to, to do that. The challenge is where, particularly where you've got an organization which is very different, um, is to grab their attention. And particularly if they're very big on social media, you need to grab their attention, uh, you know, sort of hanging on to their tail um, to, to try and get them to look at you and say, oh yes, we could do something together. And it takes time. As with all these partnership things, it takes time and it takes effort to build up the relationship. So moving on to uh, chapter five, and 
I see this actually as being, it's right in the middle of the uh, chain of valleys of death, of the valleys of death. Um, and Joe took this one on, Joanne Robbins, Met Office. And it's about the, the partnership needed between the physical sciences for the hazard and the social sciences for the impact. Um, and uh, we have a, a cast of co-authors who contributed to this chapter. So translation of hazard forecasts into impact forecasts is at the core of the warning process. Whether the impacts are communicated or not, you still need to know what the impacts are in order to know whether a warning is needed, even if you're not going to put those, the, that information into the warning. And there are reasons why you might want to sometimes and not others. And this is especially true for multiple and cascading hazards, because the, uh, the cascade can make the impacts quite um, uh, obscure if you start from the hazard. And in order to achieve this, you need partnerships among the physical, social, economic and behavioural scientists. Um, our, in a lot of situations, a lot of weather services, for instance, use expert experience to uh, fill in this information. And that's fine up to a point. It depends on the experience of the individual, so it tends to be um, inconsistent between whoever happens to be on, on duty. It does need the support of quantitative tools, and that's an area that needs a lot more work. And this is most especially true in unprecedented situations. And we saw several cases last year where the um, expert experience didn't help because the hazard was outside the range of experience of anyone. And so they had no idea that another threshold was going to be passed that, was, that, that meant there were new sorts of impacts. It wasn't just existing impacts being a bit worse. It was new sorts of impacts that they hadn't even thought of. The chapter reminds us that hazards produce tangible and intangible impacts, that they cascade from the direct impacts through several levels of indirect impacts, and that those impacts may be human, financial, or, or service related, particularly thinking of critical services. Um, financial impacts, it's difficult to judge what the size of them means, and we recommend that they should be related to household income, business turnover, or GDP, depending on the level of aggregation that you're dealing with. The relevant impacts are different for different users. And uh, for instance, an individual is most interested in the impacts on them, whereas governments and business and humanitarian organizations may be more interested in aggregate impacts. Uh, for instance, the government might be interested in how much impact there will be on GDP, uh, a very different issue from the individual who's interested in whether their business is going to be, uh, have to shut down. Uh, they're, they're related, of course, uh, but, um, but very different. Um, both process and statistical models are uh, needed. Um, depending on, on the requirement, depending on data availability. A key issue is getting access to accurate and consistent socioeconomic data on exposure, vulnerability, and the impacts. Um, and the data are often proprietary or confidential. It's almost inevitable that the uh, analysis work will have to be done either by the uh, data owner or by somebody who uh, is close to the data owner, which means partnership is absolutely essential. And uh, an emphasis here, the hazard forecasts need to be probabilistic in order to get the uncertainty in. They also need to be consistent in time and space, and they need to be uh, in a form which matches the way they're used to produce the impact forecast. And just to take an example, 
it's no good having a temperature forecast from the nearest official observing station 10 miles from the city, together with some air quality information from the middle of the city and relating that to impacts for the, for the whole city. Um, you've got to have some consistency there in what those data mean. And the relationships, uh, once again, reiterate this. Um, they take time, but you have to work together over a period. And there has to be a mutual understanding of why you're doing this, what you're trying to achieve with whatever the model, statistical or process-based, you're, you're producing is. Um, so here's an example from um, the, the UK again of um, uh, an impact of a release of uh, radioactive material, uh, not a real one, I hasten to add. Um, so in this case, the strength and the profile of the radioactive release came from the Office of Nuclear Regulation. The spread was forecast by the Met Office using forecast weather. The dose was calculated uh, using a model from the UK Health Security Agency, and the environmental limits were set by the Environment Agency. And everyone worked together to produce a single package, which was run on a single computer, but it reflects a, the strength of a partnership across those organizations. So moving on to chapter six um, about the weather, the, the gap between the weather and the hazard and emphasizing the consistent prediction of the atmosphere and the related environmental hazards. And that requires a seamless approach to environmental modeling. And in order to do that, you need a seamless access to hazard observations. Uh, you need to uh, verify your hazard forecasts using methods that reflect their use. And you need to link the models together in a way that reflects uh, correctly how the different variables are used in those different models. Um, surprisingly, perhaps given that most of these disciplines are based on physics, each of them has a different language, a different culture. They come from different backgrounds. They've developed for different purposes. Um, and partnership requires just as much effort in this area, um, if not more. Looking to the future, I see the growth of the use of integrated models, uh, integrated between the ocean, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere. Um, if it's done well, it's a great move, but it makes the models much more complicated and the implementation and costly, incidentally, <laughs> So implementation needs to be based on user benefit. Um, the big advantage of integration is that it does produce consistency, but consistency of the model does not necessarily mean consistency of what's produced as a forecast. And that requires shared situational awareness as well. Um, and that's important. So looking at coastal flooding, um, picture the image here shows some of the processes. And interestingly, we have two hazards particularly uh, involved. I'll, I'll leave aside the, um, uh, the um, algal blooms. So we have storm waves and we have storm surges, and they have different communities, um, uh, both driven by the same meteorology, uh, but they, and they both contribute to the same impacts, but there's still two distinct communities and they still need to work, work together because it's the sum of the two that determines what the impact will be on the coast. So finally, um, uh, with a cast of, of not quite thousands, but a very big number of authors, the link between observations and weather forecasts. Um, so both the numerical prediction and the very short range now casting models um, are major important inputs into hazard prediction. Forecasts are very sensitive to the initial state. I always say the atmosphere has a very short memory, like me. Um, it doesn't remember for very long, which means you have to tell it 
what the current state is frequently. And the smaller the atmospheric phenomenon, the shorter the memory. So uh, observations are critical and the way we import them, we represent them in the model is important. The development of higher resolution, more detailed process models and all these other bits of the forecasting process, really important. The kilometer scale models have been a great, uh, a great step forward, particularly in predicting thunderstorm related hazards, um, but optimizing those predictions to get really good information in the next few hours is an ongoing work. Forecasters are an important part of the process. Um, and what they will do is to translate that vast body of model output into a set of scenarios that can be used as the basis for the warning. Observations are fundamental, as I said, and the prediction models require observations that can be related to what's in the model. And that's not always easy, particularly when you're dealing with indirect observations like satellite observations. In the future, we want to know what's happening within urban areas and the standard observation standards don't work in, our, in urban areas. So we've got to move forward in that area and develop new capabilities. There are some gaps in what we can do, but meteorology and the observation lists have a long history of working really closely together. And there are some excellent examples in the book. And what we need to do is to learn from those examples and apply them to some of the new requirements that are needed. And I just flip through here, the um, steps that are in the standard process for designing a new satellite mission to observe uh, the weather. So moving on to the final chapter then, um, and we first go through in the chapter, uh, a little bit of a side step to look at fire warnings, warnings for fires in buildings, because that's something that is really well established, really well formalized, and it has some things, it has some parallels, and it has some differences, and we draw some of those out. We then look at the propagation of value up and down the chain uh, and how we can use that to enable targeting of improvements. And then we look at this template we have for a complete warning system. And I won't read it out in detail because I think I'm over time, um, but a lot of it you'll see has to be done with the users of the warning. And it's about understanding, you have to start with understanding what the risks are, how they're perceived, how people think they, they could respond to these warnings. Because if they don't believe um, uh, a risk is a problem and they don't perceive that they would do anything about it, then there's no point in giving them a warning because they won't use it. Um, we have to deliver, map the delivery chain, work out where the information can come from so that it can be delivered reliably and in the right form for the, uh, for the uh, response to be made. It has to be cost effective. We have to be able to afford to do it. Um, and if we can't, there, is there some way of making it useful to a wider group of people? We need to train both the producers and the users. Um, and in the training process, we may want to modify things a bit. If it turns out that something's really difficult to understand, if we haven't quite got the understanding right. We need to evaluate each step, not just the forecast, not just whether people responded, but every step in the chain. Where are the communications weakest? Where can we make a difference? And then periodically, uh, once we've got a working system, periodically, because things change, we need to go back to start again and say, is this still meeting the requirement? And when you've got a working system, let everyone know, because actually building trust is really important. And if it's 
saving lives, saving property, and people don't know about it, then it won't build trust in the way it could. So there we are. Um, the book is uh, available now. The DOI is there and uh, you can um, access it uh, for free. Uh, so it's freely available to all uh, on online, to every uh, emergency service, every weather service in the world. And we hope that it will help them to do their jobs more effectively. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. What a fantastic um, resource um, in terms of the books. I highly recommend um, taking a look. It is absolutely phenomenal um, what, what is available um, in that book. And so many, so many key points that are so important. And I think it'd be really valuable to explore even further how we can apply that within, within different hazards. So what we'd like to do now is um, ask our panelists to come and join us. Um, up here on the set, um, on the stage we've got here. Um, we have a great um, set of panellists with us here today. So we've got Brian who will be chairing uh, the session. Um, and then we have a number of panellists online. So here also in person we have uh, Virginia Murray from the UK HSA, um, Health and Security um, Agency. Is that right? Do you think so? Yes. And, um, and then online, we have um, Joanna Fall Walker, who is the incoming new uh, director of the UCL IRDR, which is fantastic, representing the IRDR here at UCL. We also have uh, Thomas Knox, um, Cox from Ludwig van Mielis Universität in München. And we also have Joanne Robbins from the UK Met Office. So thank you very much for joining us both here in person. We will have about 20 minutes or so of discussion with the panel members, and then we will go to questions. So thank you for those of you who have posted um, questions online. Um, and obviously those of you here will also put their hands up and we'll take a few questions at the end. Okay, over to you now. Thank you. Do I need a microphone or is this this? Um, uh, I'd like each of the panellists to tell us what they feel is the outstanding thing about this book from their particular point of view. Uh, so uh, do you want to go first, Jenny? Happy to do so, Brian, and congratulations on the book. And I'm so pleased that High Weather, this wonderful programme that is sponsored by WMO and other partners, has achieved this particular resource. To me, I've had the great pleasure of being on your advisory group for the high weather program. And I'm really delighted in seeing the emergence and offerings of these ideas that have come forward. And your values of death are something that have really resonated in much of our thinking over the years. Trying to understand and facilitate people's understanding of warnings is something that we in our health domain have been really anxious to really take forward. And for us, um, we would have loved a bit more on health, um, but we'd have also liked possibly a more of an all hazards approach, which would have been, would have been very useful considering the work we've been doing with UNDRR in partnership with WMO, UNDRR, and indeed with many other UN organizations and other partners. But what you have done is to outline how complex hazards are and how complex the warnings that go with it and how complex it is to achieve early action and engagement by individuals. And ultimately what we're trying to do is to protect as many as we can. And I think that is the, is the great achievement of this book. You've started to explain a lot of the things that we've all thought about, talked about, discussed, but haven't necessarily formulated in a way that you've taken it forward. And I think this is a really useful approach that can be applied to many of us who need to do the warnings across all these different hazards. So congratulations to all the authors again, but also I think we're on one step forward because what we do need is um, words into action. And I think the early warning words into action will come particularly 
as the as UNDRR published their report on what individual agencies will need to do for the future. So very exciting time to see how this goes forward, particularly as Corinna, you have reminded us that on the uh, 23rd of March this year, uh, Antonio Guterres did announce the fact that we need early warnings leading to early action at the World Meteorological Organization conference that I had the privilege of talking on the early action panel. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Um, Thomas, would you like to uh, give us your view? Yes, I can do. Thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, from a social science and disaster risk perspective, I think the, this process from warning to decision, that's not only about the exchange of information, it's really about building relationships. And I think that's one of the um, best key message to, to highlight here. And close cooperation between the warner and the receiver, that's the foundation of, of the successful warning for me. And um, the book makes us very clear in a very understandable way that there's real added value in this. And um, maybe from a personal note, um, and you mentioned that in, in your introduction already when writing the text, you can see this aspect of collaboration. Um, people from uh, not only very diverse um, the, um, disciplinary um, background, but also from many different countries. Um, we'd like to have more from, from more different parts of the world in the, in the authorhood, but I think that also uh, was, was uh, very helpful, very valuable for the, for the, for the book. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Joe, would you like to give us your thoughts? Uh, yes, thanks. And, and thank you for the invitation. And it's great to be here today. Um, from my point of view, the, the book has some excellent and outstanding qualities in the sense that I think this is one of the first examples I've really seen of, of the real recognition of the criticality of um, partnership across the full value chain um, and, and really driving that as being um, the fundamental aspect of how we can get to successful warning. I think it's also a really nice illustration of being able to step into another scientist's shoes, maybe in another discipline and be able to understand from their perspective, the challenge that they might see um, and, and how you can then perhaps be more responsive to, to the challenges they're facing as well. So from a development point of view, I think it, it really offers those insights, which perhaps has not been easily accessible previously. So I, I think that's that's been a really um, fantastic achievement. I think the other thing here is that it really gives an excellent map across the full value chain for those who might be looking to you know, move into this initiative if, if there's not an early warning system already in place or, or perhaps you're trying to evolve and, and develop or expand your systems. I think it, it really allows you to map your current set of um, sort of processes um, or, or your current value chain and be able to reflect on where the gaps might be and, and quite accurately determine where improvements could be made using using the book as sort of a template for okay I, I know I haven't perhaps focused in this area of the warning chain so I could maybe look to advocate for that with future funding etc so I, I think there's a number of areas where the, the book really provides that sort of impetus to to improve development for those who, who might be looking to, to do that. Thank you Joe. Joanna. Hi, a lot of it has been said already. Um, something for me that really stuck out though was that it made, you know, Virginia referred to complex problems, but it actually made them quite simple because it was written in a very accessible, comprehensible way. And it included the scholarship and it included um, you know, references to scholarship across the board and examples, but in a way that was digestible, um, which actually made it really you know, interesting. And to me, it also just came back again, in a very simple way to what are we trying to do? And I'm gonna steal a couple of sentences from the book. One was um, a critical question is, who are the receivers of weather warnings? It's a very simple question, but it's so important. And I think it's easy to forget that sometimes when we're doing this work where we might focus either on very specific groups related to who we're looking at, or we're trying to think of the problem in a too complex way and just really focusing on that. And then the other one was the warning must focus on what the warner is trying to achieve. Um, with the warning. And again, that's such an obvious thing to say, 
but what is it we're really trying to achieve and for who? And I think it really emphasizes that element. And again, going back to that partnership. So who is it for and what are we trying to do? And then later we can discuss some of the difficulties in that. But I, I really like the fact that it just got to that point, um, but also understood the simplicity of it, but also the complexity of it as well. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> continuing, um, uh, se several of the responses mentioned the partnership aspect. Um, and I, I wonder if um, you, you could um, uh, say what you think is the main barrier to achieving those, those partnerships. Um, starting with perhaps Thomas. Yeah, sure, I can do that. So for me, um, one of the major things I'm thinking about currently and looking back to, to the previous year, the year and the events here in Germany, is that um, mostly I see a problem in the implementation of knowledge. So there's there's a lot of diverse, exciting research on this on this topics worldwide, and great knowledge has been generated, but the implementation of this knowledge is often a problem, and this has many different causes. So that may be financial resources, different factors of individual risk assessments, mm -hmm. but also some really uh, let me phrase it like a political will maybe. For implementation, which may often be very low, especially in times when it's not about um, extreme weather and when there's no visible impact. And so um, that's something um, I think is um, a major issue uh, when it's um, about uh, how to implement um, this knowledge into decision making, into, into maybe um, guidelines, law, etc. Thank you. Joanna, did you have any thoughts on barriers? Yes, I think something the book talks about with the partnerships is again, it's coming back to this point about who is it for and just the huge wide range of audiences that warnings are for, whether we're talking about the residents or people at risk all the way through to organizations, emergency planners and, and so more. And also the need for uniformity and the challenge of across barriers, whether that be political boundaries, countries, different regions or for different hazards. And you know, there was mention to symbiology, colors, risk levels, systems used. So on one angle, we've got this need for uniformity, but on the other, we're trying to cater for all the different audiences and we're developing these partners across abroad. So how do we create these warning systems such that we're working with all the different partners and we're tailoring the warnings to all these different partners and yet creating uniformity. And, and I think that's a real challenge. And if we could solve that, then I think we've solved everything in a way, um, but good luck. Yeah. Virginia, do you want to pick up on that one? Yes, I'd love to, uh, thank you. Uh, to me, um, the barriers for partnership aspects are really interesting. Um, what I love in the book was the, was the section in the second chapter, if I'm correct, where we had all the, all, the, all the difficulties in trying to get warnings across. And you talked about the fact that we need a traffic light system. So when we did a project before with other colleagues, we found that red is a color that we use in many countries and in the UK as a color that is really provides warning. But when we did a project, we found that with the Bangladeshi community, it meant good fortune and money. So we realized that we really have to think about the cultural aspects so much more clearly. But again, when we talk to the Bangladeshi community, how do we communicate warnings? One of the messages that came back to us having done our hazard information profiles was that we really needed to sing the warning. So that's why it's so important to your center, Corinna, to try and see how there are alternative ways of sharing these messages. And finally, on this barriers, if I could just mention it, we have been working across the world with the global pandemic of COVID-19. And you will all be aware that the warnings that the health domains have tried to share through WHO and our many partners have not necessarily resulted in everybody feeling that the vaccination program was an incredible gift to the world and saving many lives, but actually it caused a lot of distress. So how do we get the warnings to be more effective when we do not want to cause harm, but we want to cause that message that you've been sharing so strongly in this book about saving life? Thank you. Joe. Uh, yeah, so again, going last is tricky because a lot of people say what you've already <laughs> thought of in your head. But I think one of the things for me, uh, for partnership particularly is, 
it really does take quite a bit of time to generate effective partnerships. And particularly when we're thinking about sustainable partnerships that will last for the longevity of when you want your warning system and your service to be in place, it's really important, I think, not only to recognize that it takes time to form those, those relationships, but it also takes a lot of energy to sustain and maintain them. And I think there's, you know, there's models of group development, which kind of highlight this cyclical process of forming, storming, norming, and, and then performing. And, and you can use that in this context, I think, to reflect a little bit on, on how, the, how much time it takes for partnerships to grow and to be productive. But it's also important to note, I think, that when we're thinking about the full value chain, We've got a lot of different partners in lots of different agencies with a lot of different priorities, uh, purpose for being there, that the, their, uh, their idea of success may be very different than, than others. And I think this is one of the things that's quite challenging to, to maintain because within that cross-disciplinary partnership, there's going to be different perceived values of why partnership is important. And I think it's very important as, the, as those relationships develop that that is continually re-emphasized throughout. And actually, I think the book will help with that actually um, quite a lot because I think it's there as a tool to advocate for building these partnerships and sustaining them can lead to long-term longevity of your tools um, and hopefully will only enhance them in the future. So I, I think it's a it's sort of a dual partnership there, but but there continues to be a barrier around making sure that those partnerships have longevity and sustainability, um, partly related to turnover, but also partly related to, you know, individuals working very closely with individuals um, rather than it being a true partner to partner relationship. So there's definitely strategies which can be built on and learned from um, to help achieve that, I think. Yeah, very much so. Thank you. Um, moving on. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, the, the book has been made open access, which means it's freely downloadable in electronic form. Um, and Karina emphasized earlier on the uh, call by the Secretary General of the UN for warnings for everyone. Um, and so the, the question that I'd like to look at now is how uh, the book might contribute to that um, and whether being open access will actually help that process. Um, can I come to you first, Joanna, please? Yeah, so I think it's, you know, with everything now becoming open access, or at least most things becoming open access from the academic world, at least, I think, you know, it just opens up a whole world of possibilities and that people can access the information. And as I said earlier, I think the fact that it's been written in an accessible way, so it's not just from academics to academics or just from practitioners to practitioners it, it really is trying to cross those those barriers um so you know of course making open access helps and it helps people access the information it also helps people actually understand the different communities involved by having people from so many different organizations there people actually realize who are the organizations involved in the warnings and who are the people studying it and of course the book doesn't have every single person doing so but you've got 49 of them um so it, you know i think that it's not just the access of the information in the book, it's also realizing who is doing what and the references in there as well to understand, okay, who might I connect to if I want more information? I guess the next question is what next though? You know, the information yeah. is there, but just like with warnings themselves, you know, what next to make sure people actually then uh, you know, understand it, reach it and act on it. That's yeah. the next challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thomas, would you like to uh, pick up on that one? Uh, yeah, I can. So from, Coming from academia, um, obviously open access um, accelerates scientific international collaboration. So it makes it way easier to, to find a book, um, not only finding the title and the abstract, but also like really looking into the text. And um, yeah, but maybe just to add um, one thing, which Jenna uh, already said, is that um, open access also enables you to um, retrieve um, information by machine processing. So it um, can lead to better inclusion of like the core content from the book in several reviews, maybe in drafting of text or guidelines. So people can just like easily Google it or just find uh, um, like the core content and then retrieve it and then um, build their knowledge up on it. I think that's very, very helpful. Okay. Joe? 
Uh, yeah, so I, I think the open access is obviously hugely beneficial for those countries who lack capacity in, in particularly with regard to their funding. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure that people have as much access to these types of this type of information as possible and can and try and utilize it to the best of their abilities. That's that can be challenging when you have competing demands on your funding or competing demands on time. Um, the more people who can access it, the, um, the more freely available it is. That can only enhance the opportunities for those individuals to, to be able to interrogate that information and, and act on it. Um, I think the other thing that, that was really, for me, is potentially really valuable here is that I think the book can be really used to provide support for those advocating for improvements to their warning systems. And by making it open access, it means that they can very quickly say, you know, please look at this text. I, I'm, what I need is X because I've read this book. It informs me that we could make improvements in this space. Please, can we consider the funding opportunities that might allow us to invest in this area, be that observations, be that model development, be that um, impact um, databases, etc. I think it allows people to start making those tangible moves into, you know, we need this because it will lead to improvements overall. And, and that's a great supporting text and being open access will really help with that, I think. Thank you. And Virginia? Well, to me, Brian, I am thrilled it's open access. Huge congratulations to High Weather for making sure that it was available, is available, and can be really resourced everywhere. I, I think by making it open access, you make it available to all who might need it. And I think that's really exciting. I love your case studies. I'm so glad you showed the Argentine case study earlier in your presentation, trying to make sure that people understand what we're talking about was absolutely came through as clearly as could be with that. But I also like that each chapter has its summary at the end. And I thought that really helped. And I just wanted to suggest that possibly one thing you might want to consider is translating that summary into other languages. So people can find it in Spanish, French, Arabic, Russian, Chinese, whatever the languages might be most helpful if people should ask you. I think those summaries are so key, it would help people to work out whether or not they need to get more involved in the chapters. And the final point was, as soon as you launched this book, UKHSA published the fact that you had this book in our Global Hazards Weekly Bulletin, which goes out every week because we thought it was just tremendous. So we're trying to share, and I think the more we can share across the world, the more exciting it will be for us all to engage. So just great work, Brian, and all the team. Thank you. Thank you so much, Virginia. I think we should probably let the audience have a say now, yes? Yes, thank you, that works, brilliant. Right, we'll get started with one question that we have online, and then um, if anyone has any questions in, in the room, we will um, go to those. So from James Shepherd Barron, he said, so interesting, Brian, thank you. Um, in my integrated disaster risk management optimization model called the calculus of calamity, I outlined for emergency managers and those working for them, for example, diplomats and mayors, the 60 key determinants of avoidable disaster loss. Effectiveness of early warning systems is just one of these. As a performance management indicator, I teach my students to use the false alarm ratio as a proxy for trust. I appreciate this is overly simplistic. Can you recommend a better one? Noting that resilience, behavior, risk communications, et cetera, have their own index indicators. Oh, wow. <laughs> Big, tough, long question there. Yeah, well, I'm not going to answer the question. <laughs> but um, I, I think this, I think it is more complicated, complex than um, the false alarm ratio, because I think you can, uh, you can have false alarms, you can have a lot of false alarms that people, if people understand where, why they're there and uh, why they're happening and how they relate to the information they're being given, they don't seem to have the same impact on trust um, as, uh, for instance, if, um, if they don't have that understanding. And um, there has been uh, some, a limited amount of research which has shown that if the false alarm is due to small positional errors that are explained, that it, it, uh, 
doesn't have any effect at all on people's perception. So um, I don't know if there's anybody else in the panel. Um, Joe, have you looked at this at all? Um, so sorry, that just took me a long time to find the off mute button. Um, I, um, it's a it's a really challenging question. In fact, I read this in the chat and I thought, wow, that's um, that's complicated. Um, so I mean, I, I think a bit similar to what you were saying, Brian. I, I'm not convinced that a single metric really covers this um, sufficiently. Um, and when we're talking about trust, it, it's a, it's an incredibly complicated. Um, aspect to really review and and sort of quantify almost I, I i you know each individual user will have their own perception of, of whether a forecast is trustworthy and a single metric is really not going to address that singular requirement for them in some cases it might be the consistency of the of the of the warning it might be um the the temporal um or the spatial components that are really important similarly it might be something to do with um their general gut feel for whether this is something that, that is going to offer them the right kind of information. Um, all of these things, um, based on their own values and their own priorities and their own utility, really determine whether they're going to trust that information. I think the other thing to be mindful of is in the context of our stakeholders, they're typically looking at a, a plethora of outputs. It's very rare that you have someone making a singular judgment based on a singular output. And I, I think it's um, it, it's that contextualization, that sort of around the space of the warning that also provides an indication of trust. So, you know, people will make decisions not only based on messaging alone, but on did their neighbor decide to do something? And if so, did they then do it too? You know, so it's that sort of compound level of understanding of, yes, the warning will achieve a certain amount and, and it's quite correct to test that value. But, but I think it's very much important to consider that trust has, has a very complex dynamic in terms of what people perceive it to be. So again, I'm not sure I've really answered your question, unfortunately, <laughs> but hopefully I've highlighted some points. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, did, did anybody else want to jump in on that one? If not, some more questions. Is there any questions in the room? Yes, yeah. we have one. Okay. Oh, we need a microphone. Thank you. Thanks, Brian, and thank you all for the presentation. Really helpful and an excellent book. Um, my name is Ben. I'm from the Risk Informed Early Action Partnership. Um, Brian, if you were advising WMO on the new early warning for all initiative um, with UNSG's backing and support, you know, we are hoping that that will bring further investment into this full value chain. Um, but if you're advising WMO, and we can talk about that afterwards, um, where would you recommend the investment goes or how, how would you advise them in that situation? Where do we need to invest in that full value chain going forward? Yeah. Really good question. Um, so my feeling is that the WMO has um, got a really good structure for the forecast bit of the process. Um, we have the CAP that is, uh, has the potential to do uh, a lot of the donkey work for getting the, the information, the warnings to people, but we've got a, re a really weak point in the middle where we're turning the, the hard information, if you like, whether it's the hazard or the, or the impact. But um, I mean, we're, we're weak on producing the impacts, but I think the bit we're really weak on is turning the hard information into a message that will, um, that will uh, enable people to take the right actions. And I think that's the area where we really need to invest most and that that means that it it is essentially a national issue or even a subnational issue i mean it's uh, different countries uh, produce their warnings at, at different levels of of um uh, of geography but um i think cracking the problem of how to achieve that translation uniformly across uh, 
different geographies, different administrative uh, air, um, uh, structures, and so on, is, is, is the area that's going to be the biggest challenge. Um, Virginia, is, is this one that you, you'd like to come in on? Well, I think, Ben, you've asked a very interesting question. One of the projects that WMO is taking forward, which might help Brian, is the cataloging of hazardous events and trying to pull together something that would help us to really understand more about loss and damage. And we think that if you can understand more about loss and damage, Ben, there might be a chance that we can understand how we warn for all these different types of events. So it links very closely with the high, the high weather program but it also links with how we can try and document these things that has been so much brought out in COP26 outcome statement from Glasgow about how important loss and damage is. So I believe that we're actually at an incredibly exciting time, Ben. Not only do we understand more the need for early warning systems with Antonio Guterres's call for action, we understand more about early action, but we understand why these matter. And if we can articulate this in a clearer numerical form, possibly relating, unfortunately, to the impact on humans in lives, livelihoods, and uh, sadly in deaths, under the Sendai Framework Monitor for uh, trying to report on these things, we might be able to pull this information in a way for countries to be much more aware about these impacts. Uh, we know, for instance, there are many countries that don't document these things as fully as they should, not every country by any means, about 50% of the world, have birth and death registrations. So it's really worrying that we can't even document those things fully, but we hope that perhaps by encouraging these things, which WHO, the World Health Organization, has been leading on, maybe we'll be able to improve a lot of this so we start documenting these impacts better. And I believe if we can do that, Brian, we might just fill that gap in your valleys of death in the middle, so we might go from our really good forecasting process to the common alerting protocol to try and get the understanding of why we need to do this, get the governance, get the engagement from policymakers and build systems that I hope, all of us hope, might make a really global difference. So it's a really important and exciting time. And these five years that Antonio Guterres has given us and the World Meteorological Organization become really critical particularly now that we've just built our hazard information definitions, that we have the ways that we can communicate these messages better, and we're talking much more also about translation of these things as well. Thank you. Joanna, did you want to come in on this one? Yes, I think just sort of a, a wider question on, you know, what Virginia was mentioning there about loss and damage, but also how we affect, how we can really measure the efficacy of warning systems. And again, this is alluded to in the book where I think the example of saying if there was a warning of ice and then we put salt on the road, there's no damage or you know, there's very little loss. How can you actually then measure that? And you know, one way is to use modeling of what would the modeled loss be, what the modeled lamp damage be, and then compare that to ha what happens. But we don't have that systematic catalogued, even nationally, let alone you know, across the world. And so when we learn from different events and we learn about the efficacy of warning systems, we're usually quite focused on extreme events. Um, and we're also focused on, you know, what, who survived, who didn't, why and how, but not the cases where it was successful. And I think, you know, when, again, when sort of promoting warning systems and really trying to improve them or really learn from each other, there's understudying of success, you know, and especially coming from the disaster science world, we, we tend to write and study the disasters. We, we don't tend to write and study about the success cases, but that's a huge task with a huge amount of collaboration. And again, going back to partnerships of how should we record this? So not just loss and damage, but also non-loss, non-damage efficacy and survival and, and the role that the warning system played in that. And so the first is getting that framework for how we actually measure it. And then how do we implement that you know, across borders and looking at different cases, multi-hazard as well as single hazard. So we can really understand what's been affected, what's not learn from it and help where we're lacking systems, where we're lacking warning systems to show what is best practice and how, just how effective they can be. And we're not losing all those success cases. Thank you. I have a thing about that. So I'm really pleased to hear you say that. 
Um, yeah, we've got we've got three questions. Okay. So we've we'll only, and we've got about four minutes. So maybe we've got three um, quick fire rounds. We've got two online and, and one in person. So one from Tisha Padran online saying regarding cascading risk warnings with related to dynamic hazards, how can early warning systems incorporate appropriate measures to make them more robust and reliable for the last mile? Gosh. Um, Warnings of, of cascading hazards, I think, are really tricky because so often the um, uh, the uncertainties multiply as you go down down the cascade. Um, what is often done is to say, given this hazard and this perhaps this primary impact, we could expect these other things to happen, um, and. Um, so you need to prepare for that eventuality. Um, I, I, th I think being, if you like, deterministic about the, the bottom of the cascade is, is always going to be a really difficult thing to do. Um, yeah, I think Brilliant. I'll leave that one there. Yeah, that's great, thank you. And now a question from, from Mark. Yes, um, Mark Harvey from Resurgence. Uh, congratulations, Brian, on a fabulous book. And, and I think one of the things that a number of us admire about it is that you, you bring into parity, as you said, both the technical and the, the, the social. And you say that if you don't invest in the communication, in the, in the behavioral aspects, you won't have the impact. And yet, actually, for those of us that are working on early warning systems around the world, what we find is that the that part of the, the value chain is often highly underfunded. Yes. And in many ways, our expertise is just devalued, that actually somehow the, the work of the modelers is more important. And my question to you is, how do we actually, those of us in the space of communication, community engagement, community risk reduction, um, how do we do a better job, right, of uh, articulating our expertise? Is it that actually we should work harder on elevating the, the status of one data category, which is user data, mm -hmm. and say, look, there's hazard, there's exposure vulnerability data, but there's also this critical data set, user data, which all the big companies in the world really care about, by the way. Yes, Google yeah. We not get to where it is without caring about user data. Or is it that we actually have a much more nuanced way of articulating the issue of communication itself and action and trust? Or is it that we need more kind of design experiments and, and better data? So we say, let's work with one community that, own, that gets nothing except that national forecast on that PDF in that national language. And let's work with another community that gets everything that builds its yeah. own localized early warning system with input uh, from, <clears throat> from the National Met Agency uh, and has all those partnerships, right? Mm -hmm. What is it, do you think, that those of us working on that critical element of the value chain need to do better so that perhaps the UN Secretary General's Early Warning Tool Initiative does really move beyond lots more investment mm -hmm. in the model? Sadly, I think it's it's the, the investment thing is probably even worse than you said because I, I think the modelers would say that um, they they have the same problem. The money all goes to the big flashy hardware, it goes to the supercomputer or it goes to the satellite, and making even uh, getting money to to appropriately use those things can be hard. The way they achieve it is by partnership between the users of the hardware and the developers of the hardware. And I think that would be my answer. My answer is that by forming those partnerships and working together across that value chain, you can then go to the funders with a unified approach and say every bit of this is as important as every other bit and make the case for the whole thing, uh, rather than trying to say my bit um, is more important than you think it is, and so you should be giving me some money. I think trying to to glue the whole thing together first and then get the funding is would would be my answer to that question. 
Great, thank you. Well, we're running out of time, so I'm going to do a quick fire last question because it's quite a good one to end on. So if you can just give a really short answer uh, from Hamilton Bean. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Is the title of the book meant to be mostly provocative or is a perfect warning system something that the editors and authors think is a theoretical possibility? I ask because the message optimization approach sometimes seems to downplay context and situational specificity, as well as the lack of officials control over people's diverse and variable inter interpretations. Okay, so the title was a, a statement of direction. It is towards, it is not. Um, so so I, I mean, personally, I don't believe that a perfect weather warning could be defined. Um, it's it's going in a direction towards one that I see as being the important thing. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And you've had some congratulations from Stella and the WWRP team. And uh, we've had uh, some comments um, in response to the questions online, um, including that this, this will now be compulsive um, uh, uh, reading for students going forward, which is brilliant. So um, what that leads me to do is just to say, um, to, to wrap up and say, um, correct, congrat firstly, congratulations, Brian, on this book. As someone who has also edited a book with um, over 100 <laughs> contributors. I can I know logistically how difficult that is. So it's a massive achievement and it's such a timely and wonderful um, and book. And I hope today that everyone can see um, the real value and, and the learning opportunities we can gain from, from this book. So thank you very much for all your work in making that possible. Thank you also to all our panelists today um, for coming and speaking with us either in person or, or virtually. Thank you for joining us and, and giving your insights into this and also to to our attendees here online and also in person for your questions and points. So just to remind you that the, um, the recording of this session will be available on our uh, Warning Research Centre YouTube page for you to have a look over. And we really hope that we'll see you at our upcoming events. The next one is on September the 14th and we'll be looking at Performing Warnings, which is a co-creational uh, workshop that will welcome Pablo Suarez, uh, Eugenio Rojo and Hamid Khan for an afternoon of exploration into how to communicate risk and uncertainties in warnings using performance. So that's going to be really exciting. So please join us either in person or online on the 14th of September. As a centre, we're working on developing some short concept notes um, around uh, warnings that we will hopefully start launching in the next few months. Um, and in the meantime, we very much hope to see you all at future events and do get in touch with us if you have any questions or follow up points. So thank you very much. And um, we hope you people here will enjoy our reception. And for those of you in line, hope you enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon or evening. Thank you.